Hello students, today we will deal with promoting good health, changing attitudes and beliefs. To understand and predict health related behavior, we need to first understand people's attitudes and beliefs towards health. First, beliefs is a hypothetical construct that involves an assertion, often of the relationship between some object, action or idea and some attribute. For example, the action of smoking is, has the attribute that it's expensive or it causes cancer. And while some beliefs may derive from direct experience, others may result from second-hand experience or knowledge conveyed from others. Information can influence beliefs, which in turn can then influence behavior. Attitudes describe stable feelings towards particular issues or objects. The link between a person's attitude and their behavior is an unclear one. Sometimes changing attitudes may cause a behavior change, and sometimes behavior change may lead to attitude change. And in 1980, Azan and Fishbein have found that an attitude change follows from a belief. The belief that certain actions will lead to a certain outcome matters only if that outcome is valued. For example, if people believe that exercise will make them physically strong, and if they value being physically strong, only then their attitude towards exercise will be positive. But if physical strength means nothing to them, or if they equate it with pain, then they might avoid exercise altogether. And research has shown that even when people believe that certain actions will lead to health, they will carry out those actions only if they value health in the first place. In fact, the value placed in health is an excellent predictor of both intentions and health behavior. We might expect that everyone would value health very highly, but that's not the case. Other values such as excitement and freedom may take precedence. A person who enjoys riding a bicycle without a helmet, feeling the wind and feeling carefree might value this dangerous practice above health. And research in the general population has shown that although on average health is the highest ranked of 18 values, between 20 and 40 percent of respondents do not rank health among their first five highest values. The current status of one's own health can affect the value placed on health in general. When people are healthy and feeling well, they tend to place a lower value on health than they do when they are facing serious illness. And the value placed on health also varies with culture and social class. One study has found that persons of lower social class were more likely to attach high value to being clean, owning a home, having insurance, and living in a good neighborhood than to good health, whereas middle and upper class persons most valued being in good health, having a good education, being respected by people, having children, and having friends. Thus, researchers have also found that adults tend to place a higher value on health than children. Now we will look into some of the historical perspectives towards health. In the last century, we have witnessed the tremendous advances in medicine. Because of high-tech equipment and sophisticated drugs, we now live longer as a society and have fewer acute diseases than we did 100 years ago. We are not disease-free, however, and depending on how health is defined, some might argue that we are no healthier than we used to be. Our problems are just different than it was in the past. Chronic diseases have become more problematic, and some of the most serious and life-threatening diseases we face now are tied to our own poor health practices. High-fat diet, lack of exercise, smoking and sexual behavior, sun exposure, alcohol or drug use. So in many ways, we can say that we are in the steering, we are in the driver's seat. We can steer our path to healthy behaviors or unhealthy practices. Being able to affect our own health is encouraging, but establishing and maintaining good health is not always easy. Many factors influence an individual's decision to engage in valuable health behaviors, and not the least of them are beliefs, attitudes, and intentions. Let us see some of the specific beliefs about health. The analysis of the path health information to health behavior is built on the assumption that people act rationally on the basis of realistic and logical conclusions. This approach assumes that health behavior is not driven by 
hidden unconscious motivations such as the desire to be self-destructive. Rather, this rational model of health action presupposes that if a person is convinced that a particular action will bring him or her closer to things that are valued, or if that action is seen to be in his or her best interest, the individual will make a rational decision to pursue it. Furthermore, if a person appears at first glance to exhibit irrational or self-destructive actions, we must look deeper at the underlying causes. What appears to be an irrational choice may in fact have been arrived at using facts to which only that individual might have access to. Therefore, to fully understand health decisions, analysis must be done in the process by which people evaluate health information. Let us see one of the earliest theoretical model given by Hochbaum in 1958, which is called the health belief model. This model was developed to understand why people did not engage in behaviors to prevent or detect diseases early. Therefore, it was developed specifically to help understand preventive health behaviors. And this model proposes that whether a person performs a particular health behavior is influenced by two major factors, the degree to which the disease is perceived by the person as threatening and the degree to which health behavior is believed to be effective in reducing the risk of the negative health outcome. The first factor, perceived threat, is determined by whether someone believes he or she is susceptible to the disease and how severe that person believes it would be if it developed. And the second factor, perceived effectiveness of the preventive behavior, takes into account not only whether the person thinks the behavior is useful, but also how costly in terms of money, time and effort it will be to carry out the preventive behavior. And the health belief model has been applied to many other things to influence our inoculation, exercise programs, nutrition programs and smoking cessation. An important contribution of the model is the recognition that prevention requires people to take action in the absence of illness. This model continues to be useful, for example, in explaining women's reluctance to perform breast self-examination or obtain mammograms. The limitations of this model has been reviewed by Hans and Becker in 1984, and they found that when the health behavior is complex, this model tends to be less successful than when the behavior is simple. For instance, teens with diabetes were found to adhere best to their medical regimens when they believed that these regimens were important and useful and when they felt less threatened by their disease. Perhaps greater threat in a complex behavioral situation is simply too overwhelming and interferes with successful behavior change. Moreover, the health belief model is more descriptive than explanatory and does not presuppose or imply a strategy for change. The predictive utility of the health belief model and its applicability to behavior change can be improved by adding variables such as self-efficacy or by integrating it with other models. The trans-theoretical model. The concept of health belief model was expanded into more elaborate model such as the trans-theoretical model, which is also called the stages of change model. It was first proposed by Prochaska and De Clement in 1983. This model characterizes the continuum of steps that people take towards change and it includes the activities or processes to move people from one stage to another. The earliest stage of behavior change starts with moving from being uninterested, unaware or unwilling to change, that's the pre-contemplation stage, to contemplation stage where the individual considers to change. And this stage is followed by the preparation stage where the individual takes the decision to take action, which ultimately is followed by the action stage where the first step towards the behavioral change is taken. And with determined action, the requirement for maintenance and relapses are recognized as part of the process. And in addition to these temporal changes, the trans-theoretical model encompasses the concepts of decision criteria, self-efficacy, change processes, consciousness raising, relief from negative outcome associated with unhealthy behavior, self-re-evaluation, environmental re-evaluation, contingency management, stimulus control, etc. 
trans theoretical model has been influential in research on smoking and has recently been extended to other health behaviors as well. However, the validity of the stages of change model has been questioned. And although early cross-sectional studies have supported the theory, recent longitudinal studies did not support the trans theoretical model. And furthermore, the multivariate analysis of several behavioral predictors demonstrate that the stages are weak predictors of cessation. Variables from cognitive social learning, which we will see later, such as outcome expectancy, self-efficacy, and behavioral self-control has been found to be better predictor of change than are the stages and the associated processes. But despite questions about its theoretical validity, the model has contributed to the recognition that most potential recipients of health-related behavior change efforts are not motivated to change. Population survey has shown that 80% of the target group are in the pre-contemplation or contemplation stage. That result also draws attention to the fact that health promotion and illness prevention messages could be successful in persuading people to change and practice more healthy behavior. Let us now move on to another theory, that's the theory of recent action, developed by Fishbane and Azan in 1975. This theory defines the links between beliefs, attitudes, norms, and intentions, and behaviors of individuals. And according to this model, a person's behavior is determined by its behavioral intention to perform it. This intention is in itself is determined by the person's attitudes and his subjective norms towards the behavior. And Fishbin and Azan define the subjective norm as the person's perception that most people who are important to him, what they think he should or should not perform the behavior in question. Fishbin and Azan define the subjective norms as the person's perception that most people who are important to him think he should or should not perform the behavior in question. So therefore, this theory can be summarized in the following equation. Behavioral intention equals to attitude plus subjective norms. And according to theory of recent action, the attitude of a person towards a behavior is determined by his beliefs on the consequences of this behavior, multiplied by his evaluations of these consequences. Therefore, this model suggests that external stimuli influence attitudes by modifying the structure of the person's beliefs. And according to the theory, attitudes and beliefs are related to each other. Attitudes are a function of the individual's beliefs regarding the likely outcomes of a health action and individual's evaluation of that outcome. For example, if we take Karen's attitude towards smoking, she will consider her attitude towards quitting smoking will depend upon the extent to which she believes that quitting will lead to health and upon how much she values health. Furthermore, Karen's subjective norms regarding quitting, that is, what she thinks other people who matter to her want her to do, will combine with her attitude towards quitting to determine her intention to quit. Her intention is expected to be a strong determinant of whether she will actually quit. Therefore, the behavioral intention is also determined by the subjective norms that are themselves determined by the normative beliefs of an individual and by his motivation to comply to the norms. In 1985, the original model has been revised to include the element of perceived behavioral control. Perceived behavioral control could be explained as simply the degree to which the person believes that he or she has control over a particular behavior of his or her own. It's an additional component that influences the intention to perform the behavior. And because the model applies only to planned or purposeful behavior, it was renamed to theory of planned behavior. We could better understand the theory of recent action and the theory of planned behavior from the diagram on the slide. Let us now move on to a cognitive social learning theory that has been proposed by Bandura in 1977 and has again been revised in 1986 and 1997. This model proposes that reinforcements are not the sole determinants of behavior, but that behavior changes with observations of others. And according to cognitive social learning theory, the most important prerequisite for behavior change is a person's sense of self-efficacy or the conviction that one is able to successfully execute the behavior required to produce the desired outcome. People can feel susceptible to an illness 
they might even perceive that by changing their behavior, they could bring a positive result and they could even perceive that their social environment is encouraging them to change and a change would benefit them. But unless they have the belief that they can change, their efforts are not likely to succeed. Substantial empirical evidence also suggests that self-efficacy beliefs are reliable predictors of behavior and that they can mediate the effects of intervention on behavior change, including a number of health-related behaviors. And a growing body of research and literature supports the importance of self-efficacy in initiation and maintenance of behavioral change. And self-regulation is a concept that derives from cognitive social learning theory and it includes the willpower. Self-regulation includes cognitive and behavioral processes that involve the initiation, termination, delay, modulation, modification, or redirection of a person's emotions, thoughts, behaviors, physiological responses, or environment. And self-regulation can be critical in such health protective and health maintaining behaviors as eating a healthy diet, engaging in regular exercise, and managing stress. Conversely, the failure or breakdown of self-regulatory efforts can be crucial in some risky behaviors such as smoking, poor dietary management, and a sedentary lifestyle. Although much research supports the utility of social learning theory, limitations have been noted. It's difficult to evaluate the efficacy of theory-based interventions because the studies have involved only small numbers of subjects and the intervention designs have been very complex. In addition, it's difficult to quantify and measure the conceptual elements of social learning theory, self-efficacy, influence of observational learning, and emotional arousal. Therefore, these limitations gave rise to the development of one more model, that is the social action theory given by Evart in 1991. This model attempts to integrate individual psychological processes with social contextual factors and this model builds on social cognitive learning theory, models of self-regulation, processes of social interdependence and social interaction, and underlying biological processes to predict health protective behaviors and outcomes. It views the person as influenced by environmental context or settings to which he or she brings a particular temperament and biological context. Thus, a person's capacity to practice healthy eating habits and to exercise is influenced by access to health enhancing food and safe places to exercise and by internal goal structures, self-efficacy beliefs and problem solving skills. Social action theory provides a framework for multi-level approaches to health promotion and illness prevention. It offers a theoretical rationale for intervening in health policy and for creating environments that are conducive to self-protective choices. It provides an approach for defining public health goals and modifiable social and personal influences that can be used to encourage individual health behavior change. Therefore, social action theory fosters interdisciplinary collaborations by incorporating and coordinating the perspectives of the biological, epidemiological, social, and behavioral sciences. Let us now see how health messages could be conveyed to the public that it will persuade them to practice healthy behavior. In this era, there is probably a greater emphasis on health promotion and disease prevention than any previous time in our history. As a result, we are exposed to messages intended to persuade us to engage in good health practices and avoid dangerous ones. We see television advertisements of cancer, billboard messages, at least in some of the major cities, persuading people to practice safer sex. Our friends and loved ones argue that we should lose weight, exercise more, and reduce our intake of saturated fats. And health belief models do not arise out of nowhere. Everyday information comes our way from many sources. We accept some health messages and ignore others. What determines this difference? Generally, people come to believe in something if they are convinced that it is true. And this act of convincing is carried out by the process of persuasion. Persuasion could be defined as a form of social influence in which one person uses a verbal appeal to change the beliefs and attitudes of another person. And persuasion 
can alter beliefs, attitudes, and thereby affect an individual's intention to behave in a particular way. And researchers have determined several important characteristics of messages that persuade people to change their behavior successfully. It should convey more than just facts, and the message must put together information in ways that might never have been considered and present new ideas that might never have been thought before. And it should have four important characteristics. First, it must grab attention. It must be something out of the ordinary. And second, it must be something easy to understand. It must make sense in the context of what we already know. And third, it must be something we can accept and a message worth considering and not rejecting. And fourth, it must be retained or remembered. Petty and Cassiopov in 1986 have stated that there are two routes to persuasion, central and peripheral. The central route to persuasion consists of thoughtful consideration of the arguments, ideas and contents of the message. When a receiver is doing central processing, he or she is being an active participant in the process of persuasion. And it has two prerequisites that it can occur when the receiver has both the motivation and the ability to think about the message and its topic. And peripheral route to persuasion occurs when the listener decides whether to agree with the message based on some other cues beside the strength of the argument or the ideas in the message. For example, a listener might decide to agree with the message because the source appears to be an expert or is attractive. The peripheral route also occurs when the listener is persuaded because he or she notices that the message has many arguments but lacks the ability or motivation to think about them individually. In other words, peripheral cues like the source expertise or many arguments in one message or a sharp cut. This route occurs when the auditor is unable or willing to engage in much thought on the message and receivers engaged in peripheral processing or more passive than those engaged in central processing. Fear is also a peripheral cue and has been found to be an effective tool. Individual and group differences has also has to be considered. Those for whom the subject has personal relevance do central processing of the message. For them, the message must have rich contents others process the message peripherally. For example, if we take the advertisement AIDS awareness, parents of teenagers find the issue personally relevant and are knowledgeable about AIDS. Therefore, they would seek high quality messages. On the other hand, the teenagers know less about AIDS and do not find it personally relevant. Therefore, for them peripheral processing of ads is better and should be designed accordingly. Now, why does it matter which route an audience member takes when hearing or watching or reading a persuasive message. A key prediction is that attitudes which are changed through the central route to persuasion will have different effects from attitudes changed via the peripheral route. And Petit and Cassiopo explain that attitude change that results mostly from processing issue relevant arguments will show greater temporal persistence greater predictor of behavior and greater resistance to change than attitude changes that result mostly from peripheral cues. And messages that present both sides of the argument are found to be effective. For example, the advantages and disadvantages of exercising. The person can decide for him or herself which one to believe. And when health professionals such as patient educators work one-on-one -on -one with a patient, their most effective strategy is to help the patient to actively examine arguments for and against the target health behavior. And research has found that when health behaviors demonstrate to people that there is a real threat to their health and also convince them that a particular behavior can reduce the risk, the likelihood of behavior change is greatly increased. Therefore, a message has to be designed in such a way that it would appeal to the audience, it would make them consider what is conveyed to them and it would make them adopt positive health behaviors and leave negative ones. So in this chapter, we have seen historical perspectives of health and various theories that has shown how attitudes towards health has changed over time and what all the various components involved in it. And we have also seen how messages could be conveyed that it would affect 
in changing people's attitudes and beliefs towards health. Thank you.